Hello, this discussion is about nursing research, still an introduction. And in this topic, we'll be talking about the different types of research. So the purpose why we are discussing this is for you to understand the different classes of research that you can embark on as an undergraduate student and even a graduate student. So there are several types of research. As you can say, as you can see, there are surveys. You can see that there are experimental researches. So let's know the different types of research according to their categories. Now, you have your pure or basic research. When I say pure or basic research, it's a search for new knowledge. It is useful in advancing scientific knowledge or in furthering other researches. So when I say pure basic, examples of which is that you would want to know, for example, the knowledge of people about COVID-19. That's a pure research. If I would want to know the level of cholesterol of the residents of a certain barangay in Iloilo, that is pure or basic research. If I would want to know the attitude of people towards COVID-19 vaccine, that's still considered to be pure or basic research. So its intention is to build new knowledge. Okay, for example, I want to know the lived experiences of mothers who had COVID-19. It's pure or basic research. When I talk about applied research, it involves seeking new applications of scientific knowledge. For example, if you have discovered an alternative medication, okay, an alternative to clopidogrel, we know that clopidogrel is an antiplatelet, anticoagulant, a blood thinner. If you have discovered that a certain substance could be a substitute for your, uh, for your clopidogrel, this substance could be tested by research. And this substance could be a basis or the research could be the basis for the recommendation for the use of this substance. Okay, for example, in the past, we usually do open heart surgeries for structural heart problems. But because of research, doctors were able to deduce that there are minimally invasive surgeries that could be done that could possibly involve or improve the condition of our patient. That's why you have your percutaneous coronary interventions or PCIs already. So we can do surgeries through the heart through your femoral arteries. Okay, that would give you access to the heart. That, of course, depending on the case of your patient. And then action research. When I say action research, study of a certain problem. And from the experiences, decision, actions, and conclusions are drawn. So when I talk about action research, picture an educator picture a teacher who is teaching her students about reading comprehension or who is trying to employ a new method of teaching when it comes to reading. When this teacher will be evaluating the effects of the research or effects of her intervention, effects of her reading intervention to her students, that is action research. If I have implemented a certain project in a barangay and I would want to know the impact of this research or this project, I mean, that I have started in the barangay, I am evaluating it through action research. That's the purpose of your action research. Now, let's try. If I would talk about a comparative study on the effects of fertilizer, commercial fertilizer, and then compost fertilizers in the growth of a certain plant, would that be pure research or applied research? Yes, we're talking about applied research. Now, when I would want to know the levels of platelet of patients with dengue, will it be pure research or applied research? Yes, we are talking about your pure research. Okay, so basically, when you are merely describing or you would want to know something, it's pure or basic research. Now, methodological foundations. When I talk about research, there are hundreds of methodologies available in research. Some of us might have encountered researchers for the first time and you might be thinking, oh, is there that specific type of research? Okay, so there are a lot and I'll be giving you an introduction of these methodological foundations. The purpose of having this introduction is for you to see the feasibility of the study that you will be working on. Now, so we need to differentiate between the terms methods versus methodology. When I say method, it's more of a technique the researcher used to structure a study and to gather and analyze relevant information. Highlight the word the technique, structure, gather, analyze relevant information. That is the method. 
when I talk about the methodology, it is the process of research. In other words, I can say that method is actually under methodology. Oftentimes, researchers would be using these terms interchangeably, but method is different from methodology. Your methodology would have a wider scope compared to your method. So method is a specific technique that we use to gather and analyze the data. Methodology is the process of your research. Okay, if we're looking at the basic academic research, that would usually be equivalent to chapter 2 or chapter 3 of a research output. Now, you have quantitative and qualitative researches. Oftentimes, when you will be doing research, the question that will be asked to you is, are you doing a quantitative research or a qualitative research? Perhaps we can say that when we are dealing with numbers, you think of quantitative. When we're dealing with words, you think of qualitative. That's an elementary way of differentiating your quantitative research and qualitative research. But the purpose of this slide is to differentiate to you the process of research okay, based on the five phases that I have initially presented to you. So when I talk about quantitative researches, the five phases is C, D, E, A, D. I said C then. So you have your conceptual phase wherein you identify the problem. You have the design and planning phase where you try to design what's going to happen to your research. You have the empirical phase where you try to gather, analytic phase where you analyze, and then dissemination phase, which allows you to transmit, to share the information that you have gathered through your research. Now, in a qualitative research, you have your conceptualization and planning. You have the developing of data collection strategies that is already congruent to your design phase. Your empirical analytic phase is fused to gathering and analyzing data. And then D is the dissemination of your findings. If you can notice, dear learners, there are only four major phases in a qualitative research. And like that in your quantitative research where we usually have your five. So the key difference there is that the empirical phase and analytic phase in quantitative research could be seen as gathering and analyzing data in your qualitative research. Okay, So try to pause the video presentation and look into the difference between these two. Next, let's talk about the quantitative research design. We commonly say the numbers in your research. Some of you who hate numbers may don't want to proceed to quantitative research, but quantitative research is not just about numbers. Numbers is just part of it. Okay, so let's have an overview. One, you have your experimental design. Yeah, when you say experimental design, you might thinking, oh, doing an experiment. Yes, experimental design. So when I talk about experimental design, you have an intervention. There is a treatment that is given to a certain group or population. May that be animals, may that be human subjects. But as long as you give intervention to a certain group of animals, certain group of people, it's experimental research. There are three major criteria in experimental research. On the right of the slide, you can see R, C, and M. R stands for randomization. C stands for control. M stands for manipulation. So when I need to have an experimental research, I need to ensure that these three are included. In an experimental design, there are several types also. You have your pre-experimental, your quasi-experimental, and then your true experimental. Notice that on the letters I have posted on the right, letter C is in red. Because this slide is talking about pre-experimental research. When I say pre-experimental research, it's like an experimental research which is descriptive in design. It lacks one major component. That major component is the availability of control group. When I say control group, there are two possible control groups that we can have. You have your control positive and then your control negative. When I say control, a control group is a comparison group compared to that of your treatment group. For the purpose of understanding, let's pick an example. Let's say, for example, I would compare the effects, the antiplatelet activity of malungay extract compared to that of clopidogrel. If I will be doing a study to check if the malungay is malungay extract, a possible substitute for your clopidogrel, I need to have control positive and control negative. 
When I say control positive, it's the usual treatment that is being done. It's the usual intervention that is being given to the patient. So in this case, it's clopidogrel. I am comparing clopidogrel to that of your malungay. Okay? Now, control negative. When I say control negative, the purpose is also for comparison. However, there is no treatment done for these patients or group of animals. So, an example of your control negative would be placebo tablets. It could be sterile water for injection. It could be plain NSS for injection. What's the purpose? I want to check if the platelet of this group of population would decrease in contrast to the group who has been given the malungay who has been given with your clopidogrel. So again, when I say control positive, the usual treatment, the standard of treatment at present. When I say control negative, it is no treatment at all okay, or placebo. Okay. Now, you might be wondering what is placebo if it's the first time to hear it. So when I say placebo, these are actually medications or excipients with no pharmacologic value. Okay, again, with no pharmacologic value. So it could be starch, it could be um, yeah, it could be starch, it could be flour that is being used and given to the patient as a tablet. However, that does not contain any active component. What is the purpose of that? We just want to compare. Will the platelet of these people decrease because of psychological effects? Because placebo, when I talk about placebo effects, guys, placebo effect is the effect that there is a cure given to your body, not because of the medication itself, but because of your psychological belief that this medication could help you. Okay? Now, so you might be giving your patient water if it is in liquid form. You might be giving starch tablets to your patient as placebo. The question is, is it ethical? It can be ethical as long as the study has undergone an approval by the Research Ethics Committee. And the Research Ethics Committee will ensure that your respondents are being protected. Okay, there are instances, for example, wherein the researcher or the data gatherer and the patient does not know what is being given to them. Okay, the purpose of that is for the researcher for the researcher and the data gatherer not to manipulate the results. Because it may be possible that a certain data gatherer would give good results for this type of medication because of monetary gain. So for that purpose, we have what you call your blinded studies. When I say blinded studies, it's, it means that the researcher, the data gatherer, and even the respondent or participant do not, do not know what substance is being administered to them. Okay? Now, I'll hope you take note of that. Now, let's go back to your pre-experimental design. I have mentioned that in pre-experimental design, the lacking component is your control. There is no control group for comparison. Okay? It's just descriptive. An example, post-test only design or after only survey. Let's say an example could be, I am implementing a new methodology in online class. And I would like to evaluate whether dancing in an online class would be beneficial to students. And then what I did was that I did the dancing intervention. And then after the dancing intervention, I checked the level of satisfaction of students. Are they happy in my class? Are they participative in my class? If they are, and if I have measured such data, that is considered to be post-test only design. Okay, I did the test once. So one-shot survey or one-shot case study. Next, you have the pre-test, post-test design or before-after survey. Let's point an example. Let's say I will be implementing a new program, again, in online education. What I did was to measure your happiness scale or level of satisfaction before the program. And then I did the program for a span of three weeks. And then after three weeks, I will be checking on you. How are you guys? What's the improvement in your happiness scale? So that means that I am comparing the pre-test and then the post-test. I am comparing your scores before the intervention and after the intervention. So the purpose of that is to compare. Is there an improvement in your scores before the intervention and after the intervention? Okay, you refer to that one as your pre-test, post-test design. But if you can still recall, it still lacks your control group. 
what I have there is a group who received the intervention, which is the dancing. It is the group which had the new implementation of program in an online class setting. But I ha don't have any other group to compare whether it will be effective or not. Okay, that's the purpose of your pre-experimental design. There are researches and there are researches wherein the use of experimental design is not suitable. Okay? Or there are researchers wherein a true experimental design is not feasible. For that reason, you have this pre-experimental designs made available to us. Of course, if you would look at in the hierarchy of evidence, a true experimental research would have a bearing compared to pre-experimental researches. But there are instances wherein pre-experimental researches are needed for us to formulate your true experimental researches later on in the future. The next type of experimental research is your quasi-experimental research. Now, when I say quasi-experimental, the aim is just like any other experimental research. It would want to establish a cause and effect relationship between the independent and the dependent variable. Recall in our discussion that your independent variable is your presumed cause and your dependent variable is your presumed effect. The problem in your quasi-experimental research is that it does not allow for randomization. It does not allow for random assignment. In other words, subjects are assigned to a certain group based on non-random criteria. Okay, for example, if I'm doing a research about the efficacy of drug X, okay, and then I would want to divide the two groups into A and B, and then I am clearly stating this group of people shall belong to A, this other group should belong to B. In other words, they are not randomly picked as to where they will be belonging to the group A or group B. That is quasi-experimental research. It lacks randomization. So the lack of randomization does not make it a true experimental design, instead a quasi-experimental research. Then you have your true experimental researches. Your true experimental research, as you can notice, you have the pre-test, post-test, control group design. You have the post-test only control group design. Then you have the Solomon for group study design. And then your clinical trials. If you would compare the name of this compared to our pre-experimental researches, you can see the word control group. Okay, so the addition of control group. So your true experimental researches already comply with the three criteria that we have for experimental research. So again, the three components of your experimental research are randomization, control, and manipulation. Remember R, C, and M. So looking at the screen, you could see the four types of experimental research. Allow me to elaborate on each one of them. So for the pre-test, post-test, control group, so notice that there are two groups here on the screen for comparison purposes. The group on the top is referred to as your treatment group. In your treatment group, notice that we did a pretest, and then you will have the administration of new treatment, and then you will have the post-test. In the control group, notice that we will undergo the same process as above. However, instead of administering a new treatment, we are administering the standard treatment. In the example that I have given earlier, that is the administration of your clopidogrel. Okay? So, for example, in the control group, they administer clopidogrel as an antiplatelet. And then in the new treatment group, you will be administering okay, your plant X extra. Or as an example given to me by my colleague here, administration of sagging or banana. Okay, so that will be your treatment group. Okay? Just a random example that we can hear from the audience. The next type of design is your post-test only control group design. In the post-test only control group design, notice that you have a control group for the purpose of comparison and you have the experimental group. The experimental group is the one receiving treatment. Notice that both of this group is receiving the post-test. Okay, so for that reason, it's referred to as post-test only control group design. Okay, notice the difference from the previous design is that there is no pretest associated with this one. The next example is your Solomon for group study design. So what is unique in your Solomon for group study design is that there are two groups receiving pretest 
all of the groups will have posters and then two groups will have a treatment. Okay, as you can notice for this comparison, group one had the pretest and then they received the video treatment and then the posters. Group two, they have the pretest, there is no intervention done and then they proceed to the posters. Group three, there is no pretest, a video treatment was done and there is a posters. And group four, there is no pretest, no intervention, a posttest was done. The purpose of your Solomon for group study design is to ensure that the cause of the differences between the variables is because of the treatment or intervention and not by any other causes, such as pretest, because that is referred to as the threat by testing. When I say threat by testing, it means that once the participant has already undergone the test, for example, the pretest, they have the tendency that they will get higher scores in the post test. So for that reason, we are doing the Solomon for group design to ascertain that the cause of the change or improvement or decrease in the scores is not brought about by the testing, by, uh, testing uh, threat. Okay, and instead it is brought about by the treatment. So in this case, there will be a comparison of group one pretest versus post test, group two pretest, and then group two post test, and then also compare group one post test compared with group three post test. All the possible pairing are being compared just to rule out any other cause for the variation in the scores of the respondents. On the next uh, discussion, we'll talk about the non-experimental designs. Thank you for your attention.